Good morning. Welcome to church, and if you're visiting, welcome to St. Nicholas, and we hope you feel very much at home in our midst today. If you're joining us online, as today is the Sacrament of Holy Communion, and you would like to participate along with us, please, during this next, these next few minutes, take the time to bring bread and wine as you watch the service. The psalmist writes, What shall we render to the Lord for all his benefits toward us? We will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Let us worship God. Let us sing his praise in hymn 120. In 120, God we praise you. God we bless you. Let us pray. God, we praise you. God, we bless you. You are true loveliness, excelling beauty. And in the melodies and harmonies of music, we listen for your voice. In the forty shades of green of the hillsides around us, the vistas from our shore, we look for you. In poetic words on a page, beautiful colors captured on canvas, we wait for you. In scientific discoveries, technological surprises, we search for you. With the poor and the dispossessed, with the refugee and asylum seeker, we reach for you. And Lord, in the gathering together in this time of worship, we wait for you. We can never capture you, great God, yet in the unspeakable grace of Jesus Christ, you find us and you hold us. 
O joy of loving hearts, our Heavenly Father, like a songbird basking in the summer sunshine, or a child dancing with excitement in the ocean, help each of us now to bask with uninhibited ease in the utter luxury of your overflowing grace. Saviour Christ, healer of ragged hopes and tattered ideals, physician of listless lives and limping love, walk amongst us now and lay your hands upon us, forgiving our grievous sins, restoring our fractured faith. Work your transforming skills in us and through us. Holy Spirit, present power from on high, breath of eternity, we inhale you now. Come, Spirit of love, come and baptize us afresh, clothing our drabness with your loveliness. Cascade through us all with your light and life until we too spill over with wonder and love and praise. And to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one glorious trinity, be ascribed all majesty and authority, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us hear God's word as we find it in the scriptures of the New Testament, in the Holy Gospel as recorded by St. Matthew, there in chapter 9 and reading from verse 18. Hear the word of God. Even as Jesus spoke, an official came up who bowed before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Jesus rose and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years came up from behind and touched the edge of his cloak. For she said to herself, If I can only touch his cloak, I shall be healed. But Jesus turned and saw her and said, Take heart, my daughter, your faith has healed you. And from that moment, she recovered. When Jesus arrived at the official's house and saw the flute players and the general commotion, he said, Go away, the girl is not dead, she is asleep. And they laughed at him. After turning them all out, he went into the room and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. The story became the talk of the whole district. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The hymn 710, hymn 710, I have a dream, a man once said. <laughs>
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Perhaps, just perhaps, like that unknown woman with the hemorrhage, with the issue of blood in our reading this morning, and such is the importance of that story that three out of the four gospel writers all tell it, perhaps like her, you're facing just now an impossibly hopeless situation in your life, because that was how she stood. It could be perhaps for you a debilitating illness, a marital situation, a financial crisis, profound grief, fractured relationship, or a prolonged challenge. Looking at it from a subjective point of view, as you sit there today, there might appear to be no reason to hope. If that's you, then, in my few brief words this morning, I want you to believe that you too can experience the kind of breakthrough that woman did long ago in the village at Capernaum. Imagine the scenario for 12 long, difficult years. She'd watched helplessly as her condition went from bad to worse, no matter what she'd tried. Most of us, I think, would have given up. It's a very moving story. This woman had spent all her savings in seeking the advice of so many doctors, and she was no better. In the eyes of her religion, she was permanently unclean. She would not be allowed into the services in the synagogue because of her hemorrhages. She couldn't participate in any of the religious rituals. She was looked down upon. She was ostracized. She was marginalized, alienated. She was a kind of ultimate outsider. And that's why she was so surreptitious that day in the crowded streets of the town. She'd heard about this Jesus of Nazareth, and whatever she'd heard about him had imparted to her an audacious sense of hope and confidence. It had imbued her with a boldness, a tenacity to risk everything, just as she thought to touch the hem of his garment. Oh yes, yes, she knew full well the religious laws concerning impure folk like herself. She knew that if she was found out, she would be subjected to public humiliation and very possibly being stoning violence if she were recognized. But such was her desperation. Perhaps if I can touch him, she thought to herself, perhaps even if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. Now, it's very likely that our Lord wore the traditional clothing of his day. Jesus would wear a long outer robe and a shorter one, a cloak or a mantle that had fringes or tassels on it. At each of the four corners of the shorter outer garment was a tassel which had one thread of blue woven into it. And since that outer garment was shorter, this prevented it from touching the ground. And in the Jewish faith, those four tassels represented the power and the presence of God. And that woman believed in Capernaum that if she could just touch one of them, then she'd be healed of her chronic illness. And against all odds, now I've walked through the ruined streets of Capernaum today, it's an, ar an archaeological site, and the streets are so narrow, you can imagine the crowds must have been jam-packed together, Against all odds, in that, those crowded streets, she made it to Jesus, she touched the garment, and the bleeding stopped. But she got more than she bargained for. For you see, Jesus felt the surge of power flowing from him. In other words, it was real. It wasn't just symbolic any more than the sacraments are just symbolic. Jesus wanted the woman to face him and acknowledge what had happened to her. Jesus wanted to make sure that in the full view of all the townsfolk, 
In the open, the woman's new status would be made known. He wanted to make sure that no longer would she be excluded in the wider community, no longer scorned, but now she'd be able to converse and resume a normal life. Now she'd be able to go back to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Now she'd be able to go back to her family. Now she can invite friends round to her house. Take heart, daughter, said Jesus. Take heart. Your faith has made you well. Jesus told her that her faith had healed her. Not her actions, but her faith. And that faith was certainly expressed in her actions. It wasn't her fingers touching the hem of his garments that healed her. It wasn't the hem of the garment, but it was his love, his grace, his power that made her whole. If I touch even his clothes, she said, I will be made well. When I've had the privilege of being in a pilgrimage to the land of Israel, Palestine, the land of our Lord himself, which I've done four times, and I'd like to think that I'd be able to do it once more, I've marveled at the materialistic forms of Christianity. The flickering candles, little bunches of flowers, the crude stucco statues. And I've watched Christians from all over the world kneel in homage at the place in the church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the site of Calvary. And they've knelt in deep devotion and they've placed their rosary beads and their little Bibles and their crosses on the spot where tradition has it that the body of our Lord was taken down from the cross. And I've watched them in very deep devotion, mistaken and misdirected, some would argue. And yet, and yet, there is something real behind it all. I had only to sense the intensity of the devotion of those simple worshippers from all over the world to be ashamed of my own cold rational faith. Isn't it perhaps very true that these folk, and indeed those in France and Germany and Italy and Spain, who kneel before their holy relics, have a deeper need and a simpler trust in God than we who argue and discuss and dispute about the faith? Aren't they simply in what they do there trying to touch the hem of his garment. And the truth of the matter is this. There's a whole lot of brokenness and pain and suffering in our world today and every Sunday in pews and churches throughout the land. We crave healing. We need reconciliation and restoration. Like that woman long ago, we desperately want a different reality. We want to feel loved and whole even though, like her, we feel it's all too late. And yet these healing miracles of Jesus, those miracles of Jesus that we read in the Gospels, they just seem too unreal to our rational, Western, sophisticated minds. And even so, even so, the desire to touch the hem of Christ's garment is still very much real. We want so desperately to believe. We want so desperately to hope for something more. We want to know that indeed we are lovable and salvageable, that we belong and that our lives have meaning and purpose. Friends, our gospel reading today is not a fairy tale. It's not a fable. It's not a lovely story for the children in Sunday school. Our gospel tells us what happens when we have nothing left of ourselves and we are willing to lean completely on that radical gift of faith. Simple reason alone would have prevented that unnamed woman in the narrative from expecting to be healed. Lord knows she spent a fortune over the years in trying every conceivable way to be made well. So at the end of a tether, when there was nothing else to rely on in desperation, she reached out for the merciful arms of Christ. And she found healing. She found wholeness. Friends, if everything's going well with you today, praise God, that's wonderful. We rejoice in that. 
But if that like that lady in Capernaum, you're as low as you can get, and you feel as if you're at rock bottom, dragging yourself from one day to the next, then drag yourself in the direction of Jesus. And when he comes to you very shortly in the sacrament, take his body, take his blood, draw on his healing power, knowing that our Lord loves you more than anyone else ever has, and that he wants to break through to you by responding to his word, by touching the hem of his garment, expect to be made whole, and wonder upon wonder, that same surge of healing power will flow from him into you. Because, quite simply, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Friend, you can bet your bottom dollar that Jesus knows when we are reaching out to him, and he will not leave us bereft. And as the elements come round to you today, and you hear him ask, who touched me? May you have the courage to say your name. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be ascribed all honor and glory as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Friends, since the Reformation in 16th century Scotland, when Protestantism became the recognized faith of the land, congregations gathering in great city churches and small village communities to celebrate the Lord's Supper have professed their faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed for over 400 years. In that common faith, we follow in that tradition and so I would ask you to open your hymn book at number 628 to follow in their stead and stand together as we recite our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand in your place. I believe. Please be seated. It has done my heart so much good to see our church so magnificently dressed for communion today. It's been three long years since we've been able to do that, and it's absolutely wonderful. And I want to say thank you to all those who have been responsible for dressing the church and preparing for our services of Holy Communion today. It's lovely to get back to normal once again. No coffee after church today, but the coffee resumes next Sunday. And Louise is looking for volunteers. We're covered for the rest of June, but we're looking now into the month of July. And if you can help with the Kirk Cafe in July, would you please speak to Louise? There'll be a retiring offering after the service today for the Kirk Session funds. May I thank most profusely the Reverend Douglas Moore and the Reverend Jack Brown, who so ably filled the pulpit these past two Sundays to allow me to, to time off. Now, didn't I choose the most wonderful fortnight <laughs> to have a break? And I didn't have advance notice of it. I just took it, and I loved it. I wasn't away anywhere. I just enjoyed being at home, doing different things at home. And who needs Spain when you've got Presswick Prom? It's absolutely wonderful. And so I've enjoyed it, and I'm very grateful to Douglas and to Jack for their hard work. These are all our intimations. Come to the holy table, 
not because you must, but because you may. Come not to testify that you're righteous, but that in your frailty and sin you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and want to love him more. Come and touch the hem of his garment. The communion hymn, number 664, singing the first four verses, Hear, O my Lord, I see thee face to face. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Dear friends, as we draw near to the holy table of our Lord, let us listen once again to the words of the holy institution as delivered to us by St. Paul in his first letter to the church in Corinth. St. Paul writes this, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and when he had blessed it, he broke it and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This, test, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, in response to his gracious invitation and in obedience to his command, we draw near to the holy table in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as Jesus took bread and wine, I take these elements of bread 
and of wine, to be set apart from all common uses to this holy use and this mystery. And as Jesus lifted up his voice in thanksgiving and prayer, let us follow his example. Let us pray. Creator God, you are life, filling the universe in your splendor, yet closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. No name embraces you adequately, yet we have been taught to call you Father. And in that simple faith, we recognize the world as the Father's house and your delight. You've brought us in safety to this hour, and we thank you for all your goodness to us. This town where we live, with its exquisite panorama over the Firth of Clyde, the folk who people our days, the thoughtfulness and kindnesses so lovingly given, the happy memories of time shared with loved ones and friends, the simple pleasures which summertime brings, we thank you, O God. A birthday celebration, news of the birth of a baby, restored health and strength, a letter and postcard from a dear friend, a beautiful painting, a garden filled with abundant color, an inspiring book, leisure pursuits on the golf course, the tennis court, the bowling green, or sailing on the sparkling waters, we thank you, O God. And above all, our praise is unending for Jesus Christ, in whom we see your love in action, your grace lived out in a life of joy and love and peace, in deeds of patience and goodness and kindness, in words of gentleness and self-control. Heavenly Father, even as we speak with thanksgiving, a shadow falls across our gratitude, for at this very moment there are children dying for reasons which money could cure. Millions of boys and girls in the Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, Afghanistan. There are folks scavenging in the gutters to survive. Communities torn asunder by hatred, by natural disaster. Greed and enmity stalk our globe. Bless governments and decision makers that they may work together for the good of all the human family. Continue the efforts of all those who seek to restore peace to Ukraine. And bless the nations of the West who have opened their homes and their hearts to welcome the millions of refugees. Bless our own Ukrainian family here. And bring peace, Lord, ridding our world of the warmongers and the hate that they spew. Bless Charles and Camilla, set over us as king and queen, that they may ever seek to unite the people of these islands in the common good. Give our monarch, ministers of state, who seek integrity in all things, and work for the people of all the nations of this land. Continue to bless our surgeons, our doctors and nurses, and all those who strive to bring healing and health in these difficult days for our health service. And those who work tirelessly in our communities to enable us to function every day. And add to our thanksgiving, O God, a holy rage, that the church may not rest until we've done what we can to make our world a lovelier and kinder place. Take the money which we've brought with love and devotion, that it may reveal your divine love in our bleeding and battered world, that through the church, justice and reconciliation will prevail. And for all those whom we miss more than words can ever express, we praise your glorious name. They now dwell in that light and accessible hid from our eyes. They are free from the trials and tribulations of life. Keep them in your eternal love until that day when we will, in your mercy, be reunited with them. And now, sovereign God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon this bread and wine, set apart for this holy use, that they may become for us the very body and blood of our Saviour Christ. In this sacrament, Lord, may we indeed touch the hem of his garment, 
through him who stands amongst us now, healing and blessing, even that same Jesus Christ in whose words we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. According to the Holy Institution, the example and the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as a memorial of him, we do this. Who the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had blessed, he broke it and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. Margaret, the body of Christ broken for you. Craig, the body of Christ broken for you. Craig, the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Margaret, the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. The gifts of God for the people of God, blessed are those who have been called to his table.
take this and eat it. This is the body of Christ broken for you. Take the cup and drink from it in remembrance of him.
The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you glory, thanks, and praise that generation after generation, folks following Christ have gathered around his table. It has been our privilege to do so today, Lord, that Christ has met us and brought us into communion with him and with all who love him. By your grace, grant that we may continue in this holy fellowship, that we may go from here to live to the glory of his name. Lord Jesus Christ, in this bread and wine you have come to us, and now we go back out into the world filled with your goodness, your love, your mercy, your compassion. Take us and use us to your glory. And to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be ascribed all honor and power now and forevermore. Amen. Our closing praise, hymn 664, six, six, singing verses 5 to 7, Too soon we rise, the symbols disappear. Now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you and all those whom you love both near and far this day and forevermore.